Hello, everybody, and welcome. Um, my name is Sarah Wilson. I'm, I'm uh, Director of Specialist Services with ELFT, and I'm incredibly pleased and privileged to be able to welcome you all um, to this special screening uh, of this new documentary this afternoon, which is focusing on one woman's experience, one young woman's experience of mental ill health. And it's so lovely um, to have service users and parents and carers, um, representatives of staff, govern of governors, of colleagues from health and social care who, who are really interested in improving the health of um, uh, mental health of children and young people today. So this film today is one of a number of films that have been developed by young people to raise awareness um, of mental ill health, mental well-being, and to challenge the stigma that is often associated with mental health. So Caitlin's story is a brilliant and hard-hitting film um, in which we'll hear um, and see her experiences of panic disorder and, and se severe anxiety. We're going to learn how she and her family have kind of managed uh, to cope with those experiences and have managed and Kaylin's experiences of getting help, uh, getting help in school and getting help through mental health services. And Caitlin's here today with her mother, Nicola, and we thank them so much for sharing their story. Um, and you'll have opportunities. Uh, there'll be opportunities for a question and answer session later on. So, as I said, Caitlin's story is one of a series of films that have been developed and produced by young people in Bedfordshire and Luton, which, have, uh, which has come out of the people participation work that's been going on here for a very long time. And the filmmaking has been developed by young people and brought into reality by the joint work with Jamie Copperwheat of Copperwheat Films. So welcome to this evening. Uh, I'm now going to hand you over to Nikki Scott, who's our lead for people participation in Bedfordshire and Luton with her colleague, Ashleen Callahan. Thanks very much indeed. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the premiere of Caitlin's film. My name is Nikki Scott, and I'm very proud to be the participation lead for Beds and Luton Cams. And I'm very lucky to work with amazing young people who access our services, such as Caitlin. At a time when the amount of young people who are facing challenges with their mental health is on the increase, it's more important than ever to raise awareness about these difficulties and to educate people in how best to support and help others. We need to challenge stigma and encourage young people to ask for help when they need it without fear of discrimination. That's why this film is so important and why I'm so proud of Caitlin for having just decided to share her journey with us. Um, this has been such a long time coming. We actually filmed in 2019 and we were due to host a live premiere last May. Um, obviously, lots of things have happened since then, but actually the delay means that more of you are able to join us and more importantly, we'll be able to hear from Caitlin just how far she's come now in her journey. Um, please, can I introduce you to Caitlin and her mum, Nicola. Hello, everyone. Um, thanks for taking time out of your Friday evening to join me in the public airing of the documentary I made with Copper Week Films and Cam's Bedford over a nine month period in 2019. My personal experiences are the reason I was approached in relation to making this documentary. Having always had anxiety, it came to a head in 2017 when I experienced a mental health crisis in which I stopped functioning with the world around me. Prior to the documentary being suggested, I'd taken an active role in supporting CAMH in raising awareness of mental health in young people following my own experiences. Many opportunities have been afforded to me, such as keynote speaking at local conferences, workshop lead at local conference, training as a mental health resource assessor and speaking at many schools and assemblies. I've also done meetings for CDC inspections and I won Young Trainer of the Year Award and there's also been so much more. I feel honoured to have been asked to take part in this documentary in addition to all the other opportunities I've already been given. Um, there are multiple re reasons that I willingly agree to do the documentary. I feel that it will create resources to use in training professionals in both the education, health and social care sector, providing an example of a young person and their direct experiences with anxiety and panic disorder. I experienced so many professionals that wrote me off and considered me beyond help. No one is beyond help, they might just not be ready for it at the time. I returned to school because of my pastoral support, not only because 
she was persistent um, and she was patient. If I and my parents had encountered more professionals earlier on who considered me through that lens, I may have not reached crisis point. We need more professionals to be as patient as they are persistent with young people. I'm hoping this documentary will encourage that. This documentary will also be used as a resource in the education of young people in both raising awareness generally and supporting those that are currently experiencing their issues with anxiety and panic. I want to offer hope to those young people that are currently feeling overwhelmed by their own anxiety, show them that there is help out there and that there is always a better hour, day, week or month that follows their worst. I'm not the only young person to create a film with Copper Wheat and Cams, and there are so many fantastic documentaries on gender identity and what it's like to actually be at Cams, and I really hope this one will spur you on to watch the rest. Originally, we intended to have a formal premiere last May, but we couldn't because of COVID, so here we are. So I'm now 19, I finished Bedford Sixth Form with good grades and I'm in my first year of university studying mental health nursing. Of course I still have anxiety and I always will, but some weeks are better than others and I now manage my symptoms with a mix of CBT skills, medication and the support from my family and friends. Alongside the reminder that it does get better and the feelings of intense anxiety are temporary and I can get past them. I hold on to the fact that my experiences of anxiety, panic disorder and crisis and also recovery will help me in my career as a mental health nurse. If what I went through gives me the ability to help one person, it will have all been genuinely worth it. And this is my mum. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm Nick, Caitlin's mum. I'm immensely proud of Caitlin in terms of how far she's come. And then she's got the courage um, to have made the documentary and share her experiences um, with the main um, goal and hope of helping others um, that may be experiencing something similar and families that may be experiencing something similar and raising awareness just in general of anxiety and panic disorder and how it's important that we recognise that not everybody fits the stereotypical um, mould of what we consider anxiety and panic disorder to look like um, and Caitlin very much breaks that mould in, in that respect in terms of everything she's done before um, and after, um, very much not the typical anxious person that many people expect. Um, it was a really difficult time for our family. So in terms of the content of the documentary, I don't think it was originally planned that I would be as involved no. as I was <laughs> no. um, it, in the filming of the documentary. However, um, in supporting Caitlin in, in the documentary, uh, meant I also got an opportunity to share my experiences as a parent. Um, and my experience as a parent in supporting my child through something that is definitely not in the parenting manual. Still haven't received the parenting manual, but I'm sure it's not in there. Um, and in terms of sharing our experiences and the, the trying time it had for our family with the aim of encouraging other mums in my position that it's not forever and there is a light at the end of the tunnel, as cheesy as that sounds, um, and what you're experiencing at that point no matter what you might feel, it genuinely won't, genuinely won't be like that forever. So I feel very proud, very blessed, very lucky to be part of this process. And I'll take the opportunity now to thank everybody at CAMH and all the professionals that Caitlin has dealt with for many, many years, but especially <laughs> during her crisis and since, in giving her the opportunities um, that have been afforded to her. Mm. Um, thank you very much. And especially to um, Nikki and obviously her department and Isling as well. Um, you guys were a massive part of my recovery in terms of being able to come to terms with what happened and be okay with it and then start to talk to people about it. So thank you to you guys, I guess. I wouldn't have been able to do this without you. Thanks, Caitlin and Nicola. Um, and after we've shown the film, there will be an opportunity for um, the attendees to uh, participate in a Q&A panel with Caitlin and Nick. So um, please think about any questions um, that you might like to ask. Um, and I know that we've got representative here from Parent Carer Forums, and um, I'm sure it would be really helpful for you as well to um, speak to Nick and to Caitlin. I'm going to hand you over now to um, my colleague, Ashling, um, who's just going to go through a few housekeeping rules. So thank you. Thank you, Caitlin, for sharing that amazing context to the film and Nicola. Um, I think it really helps that gap between us filming and this 
film being shown to know all of the amazing things that you've got on to achieve in the meantime. So a bit of a blessing in disguise, this delay. Um, I'm just waiting for Chris to hopefully bring up the housekeeping slide for me. Thank you, Chris. So um, first things first, this is being recorded. However, it's not that scary because it is a webinar. So the only faces that we will be able to see are the ones that you can see at the moment. So your face won't end up on the Trust YouTube. Um, so please don't worry too much about that. We do have the Q&A box for you to contribute any questions for Nicola and for Caitlin at the end of the showing of the film. So if you could use that um, and the chat generally, I can see the messages coming in, which is great. It's great to see that people are out there because obviously we can't see too much at the moment. Um, as I mentioned, this whole recording, including Caitlin's film, will be posted on the Trust YouTube. So um, hopefully there'll be a few people watching it for the first time on there as well, which is great. Um, and finally, if there's any technical difficulties, we have the amazing Chris here, who I think is using host <laughs> as his alias, um, who has done an incredible job of helping us put today together. So a massive thank you to Chris for that. Um, and if you have any trouble, please feel free to message myself. I can certainly try and help or Chris in the meantime. Um, so if you get the next slide, Chris, I'll just talk through the plan for this afternoon. So obviously we started off with some lovely introductions um, and I'm currently going through the housekeeping. So once we finish this section and before the film, we will have a five minute break from 4.25 to 4.30. Um, during the break, there will be a slide on screen which has a trigger warning on it. Uh, this film does discuss anxiety, panic disorder. There is a clip of Caitlin experiencing a panic attack in the film. So I just want to highlight now, it's really important if you need to take time out, take a break, please do whatever you need to look after yourself while you're watching this film. Then we'll have the film showing from 4.30 till 5.20, followed by another five minute break. So you'll be able to, you know, digest what you've seen, go and get a drink and type any questions that you have for Nicola and Caitlin in the chat then. That will be followed by the Q&A. And then before we wrap up, Caitlin and her mum have some amazing final words of advice for everyone in the room to listen to. So we'll finish with that from 5.45 till six o'clock. Um, so yeah, that's that's how this afternoon is looking. I don't know whether we want to start with the break now. What do we think, guys? Hi, everyone, and welcome back. I can see that we've had some more people joining us. We're a bit ahead of schedule as well. So I think we're going to be ready to show the film now. Yeah. I'm so ridiculous. My early years were fine as far as it goes. There was nothing extreme, I suppose, that happened that caused any of the issues that came later on in life. My name's Caitlin. And in many ways, I'm just like any other 17 year old. I like to go out, spend time with my friends. And most people probably look at me and think I'm quite confident. But there is a side to my life that no one's seen. Until now. You know all the physical signs, Caitlin, and this is what it is. Yeah, you can. I can't do this. Come anymore. sit down. No, no, I can't do this. Yeah. I don't know what this is. It's just panic, Caitlin. You know it's anxiety. Well, it's not. <laughs> Come and sit down. Come sit down. This is my journey.
Sorry, buddy. He's well loved. Sometimes we sit him in the middle of the table and eat dinner with him. I feel part of the family. I wanted to do this short film to show that not everyone with anxiety displays in the same way. I also wanted to try and figure out how I was missed by so many professionals throughout my childhood and how I only really got the help I needed when my anxiety was picked up on in my late teens. Um, I was, from what I can remember, I was a very happy child. Um, my mum loved me, my dad loved me. There was no trauma, as it were. Why are we always on holiday? I, I think that's the only time I took pictures. Oh, I like that. I'm in the bath, in the sink, in the caravan, because that was how mum bathed all three of us. That when we went, when we went on holiday, that was your, that was your first holiday ever to Hastings. Yeah. That was your very first caravan holiday. Um, you put me in the sink. I put all of you in the sink. It's, I was put in the sink as a child. Were you? Yeah, on a caravan holiday. That's crazy. But yeah, there was nothing that ever went wrong as such. No, there was no... Uh, pretty normal. Relatively. Well, relatively, very, I'd it's say. Just like you? any other child. I don't remember, Mum. <laughs> Mum and Dad used to bring us here. On holiday all the time as a kid. Always, always come here. It's one of my fondest childhood memories. I felt it was really important to come here because even as a child, we spent <laughs> many of our holidays here um, that were perfectly normal, perfectly happy. Um, as we used to, the whole family would come down, we'd have picnics on the beach, we'd get sand everywhere, um, we'd sit under the, we'd, we'd make like, we'd take a whole section of the beach up as a family and we'd get windbreakers and we'd get the umbrellas and we'd build sand castles, people would get chucked in the sea, um, granddad would push everyone over, it was just, it was just happy. There was nothing that I could recall on or that anyone that could recall happened that could have caused this I genuinely do think I was just born this way and that's what I mean by it doesn't discriminate like I'm a pretty regular person I haven't got one of those extreme lifestyles or I'm just Caitlin from a loving family I've got a loving group of friends but it, it chose me I don't really think that people expect uh, a crippling like anxiety to come across in a way that's quite introverted like I'm gonna sit here in this corner and I'm not gonna move and I hate public speaking and I don't have any friends and I don't like doing this and I refuse to be out in public without a safety blanket or whatever when in actual fact that's not true because I'm a living breathing example of the inaccuracy of all of those typical ideas of an anxious person do you remember Jolene Jolene yeah I used to get the little guitar out of thinner leather and just stand there you and play did. it and you used I to make everybody come and watch you the only lyric before. I know is Jolene, Jolene. <laughs> I know. Oh, any audience that you could get hold of yeah, yeah you used to make Kate who, who at the time oh I've done that sorry who at the time was my boss yeah you used to make Kate sit down at, when she got in from work yeah and um, and you'd make her sit down to watch you perform something. Sounds about right. Yeah. It's and when you think back to grandma and granddad's when you used to get the, the drum microphone kit. and the drum kit out and... and this one. August 2005. I, when, I, when people ask me, when did it all start? Or um, for me, it started when Caitlin was about four years old. And I wouldn't even say it started. It got to the point where it was impacting her life and our life as a family more. But at that stage, the term mental health was not used, anxiety was never suggested, and it, because they're all very physical symptoms and some behavior as well. She, it was a regular thing for Caitlin to bolt out of the classroom for no apparent reason. There were times when she could, she'd bolt right outside the building and go and hide under the sheds, and that was considered a behavior thing. And towards the back. That's your first sports day. Exactly. Yeah. Why do I look so unimpressed? I hated it. Did I? I hated it, yeah. That's why I'm the only parent up with you, putting on your oh my God, it's hat, 
Oh, you went so. right. I remember that. Did you me? ran to the back gate. Didn't want to join in. So you walked with me the whole way. I did the whole thing with you. I was the only parent that was walking with their child to encourage you to do it because you were running to the back gate. Yeah. And didn't want to join in. You are literally holding me throughout the whole thing. She would regularly double over and cry and hold her stomach and pant and sweat. And I vividly remember her holding onto a door frame, being dragged in to school by her teachers because she didn't want to go to school. And that's how I perceived it at the time. She just wanted to stay with mum. But actually, it was anxiety presenting itself in fear of going to school. Mm-hmm. Like every day after school, I would get, you need to speak to Katie. She cannot just take herself off and wander around the club, wander around the school. You were four years old, <laughs> four and a half years old. But, but n- n- at the time, nobody, mm-hmm. nobody put the pieces together. And certainly mental health was never mentioned or anxiety. No. I think the reason it was kind of like brushed off or not looked at in detail was because it was just me. That was just who Caitlin was. Caitlin would freak out if we did something out of the blue or Caitlin would get really upset and uncomfortable if someone changed plans at last minute. It's just always been who I am. So I don't think people thought, it wasn't something that came on and then started to cause difficulty. It had always been a bit of a rocky path, which was I think why people were just like, oh, it's just Caitlin being Caitlin, which is fine. But at the same time, it's not because maybe it could have been stopped earlier. So I was labelled as attention seeking. Um, there was no other way about it. She clearly just wants everyone to be focused on her at all times. Um, and I think from like a parent's perspective, that left mum feeling quite um, like, what have I done wrong? Why are they, why is Caitlin like this? And then why are they making out like, She's just doing it for attention. When I know my child, I can see that there's something going on. Um, the school had no interest in helping me whatsoever. Um, even through middle school and all of those different stages, people were like, she just it doesn't make sense. And then comes in the whole, she just, she's she's confident. She like, she's so loud. She's laughing about with everyone. Uh, she's running about, she's making noises. She's putting on dance shows and singing to everyone. There's no possible way that this child can have the anxiety that you make out she does. Like, she can't have crippling stomach aches and sweaty hands constantly if she's making all of her friends laugh and cracking up all her family. Like, it doesn't make sense. So I think that was one of the main reasons they refused to accept it, because I just didn't fit the mould. Throughout my life, I've seen a variety of different practitioners from a variety of different services. Each had a different idea of what they thought was wrong with me. Some thought it was trauma from a past life and some believed it was allergies. But none of them ever said that they thought that there could be a serious underlying issue that could come back and impact my life in a way that it never had before. Now, people always thought it was because of her GCSE, she had a mock exams. I think they were probably the icing on the cake, but her anxiety ever since she was tiny had bubbled away on the surface and we'd had talking therapies through the years. She'd been under um, CHUMS a couple of times and CAMH a couple of times as well. So it was always there bubbling under the surface. But in year 10, it just, and I, I can honestly say there is nothing that went, that's the moment where actually the anxiety got to the point where it, she lost control of it, we lost control of it and it impacted her life. There wasn't, a big moment. It was just a build up. Just kind of spiralled. I remember there was a day where I'd arranged to go down to Priory with some of the girls and I'd woken up that morning, I'd been such a sore, I was so hot. I don't know if you remember this. And I came out onto the landing and I like fell over slash like past, I was boiling. Like I'd got myself so worked up and that was kind of I, when it settled in. And then it sort of didn't leave for like six months. So at that high level, it just didn't go away. It was just there the whole time. So initially it would start with, oh, I don't want to go to school today. No, come on, Caitlin, you need to go to school today, come on. To the point where, and she went, there was very, very, very few days that she had off on the run up to it. But then it gradually got worse to the point where she would leave the house unwashed 
teeth unbrushed, hair not done, and she would, at that point she would be going into school and sitting with Miss Wright, her pastoral support, barely going to any lessons, but we felt some sense of achievement, strangely, because she was in school. Um, in retrospect, that wasn't the place she needed to be, but I think the external pressures of what a child of that age should be doing sort of overshadowed our judgment in what we should be helping her to manage. Always, obviously, always experience anxiety, but nothing to that extreme. I didn't want to move. I didn't want to be around people. I spent the majority of my time in this corner of the sofa, sat under a blanket. I cannot describe the way it felt. I just felt trapped. I wanted to be out of my own skin. And in the same way, I didn't quite feel like I was there. I didn't feel like I was me. I didn't feel like I was a real person. We were having to lock windows and doors and hide keys because she was physically trying to get out of bedroom windows. Um, just because she she wasn't thinking logically. She would suddenly bolt upright and feel the need to bolt. And the nearest exit she could see was a window. And she would go for it. And we had to lock all the doors and hide the keys. There were... Um, so like a period of six to eight weeks where she would run out the house uh, day, night, whenever um, and there were times where she even ran out of the garden onto the main road. I was not sleeping for 12 hours on end. I was collapsing over the side of this sofa after six hours of just pure panic um, because I just I couldn't do it. I was running up and down the street in my underwear up and down the stairs, I couldn't sit still. There's a tree outside our house that we, we quite often, I'd quite often bolt to as well from the list if it was too much in the house. I'd go and sit under the tree, but, and I was sat under the tree because it was three o'clock in the morning, I hadn't had any sleep. She was screaming for an ambulance constantly. Um, and she ran after me but it was delayed, so she couldn't see where I was. And it wasn't that I ran away from her, it was just I needed to get out. My husband said, go, take five minutes, I'll deal with it. Um, and she realised that I wasn't there, so came running out after me and was shouting at the top of her voice, like three o'clock in the morning, Mum, 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 where are you, where are you? And the shadow of the tree hid me for a little while and I couldn't be seen and she didn't clock that I was there. But that's what I thought at the time. But then actually, when I realised that she was in a tiny vest and a knickers and running, screaming around the street, looking for me, I stood up, I said, Caitlin, I'm here, it's all right, I'm here. Just taking five minutes. And it's like she looked through me. She didn't actually register that I was there. And I was standing in front of her and I had my hands on her shoulder and she was just screaming for mum. I was all right, darling, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. And she just couldn't see me. And that was probably the worst moment for me as a mum, because I had no control, none. And that was definitely when psychosis was tapping her on the shoulder. Um, and for me, that's the highest low point of the whole crisis um, experience, um, because it's the most, I don't know, the most significant. I, I suppose when people talk about mental health, they talk about these extreme, um, you think about the extremes of mental health. Whereas actually, when you talk about anxiety, it's, it's quite often used as quite a flippant phrase or a flippant comment. But actually the, the journey in which anxiety can take a person on can impact their life so significantly that it's almost like you need anxiety and then an add-on term to it because that's what Caitlin was experiencing. It was really traumatic and it was really extreme and it was really scary. Like, there were points, even though I, I knew it, that I genuinely did think my heart was like going to fall out my chest or I was never going to sleep and I was never going to get better and this is going to be my life. Like It's actually petrifying because I know there were times where suicidal thoughts had sort of taken a little bit of a hold and if it had continued to get any worse or continued on for longer periods of time there probably is a possibility that I could have acted on some of them which for me to 
could think about is just by this point the support in school was phenomenal i've met the most amazing support worker ever um miss wright um who wanted nothing more than for me to be comfortable and for me to come back to school and for me to continue to flourish as the child i was which it was a shock to the system for my whole family like someone's actually looked at Caitlin and gone she's a fantastic person but she's got these issues can we do something about it it just seemed so real that someone had noticed she she went to beyond for me um, and I would never be able to thank her enough for that there was there was nothing she didn't try she'd walk around the school grounds with me when I was in a state just to try and calm me down and she'd bat off all the kids asking questions like just leave to it um she'd check up on me um I'd go and sit in her office and if I was really stressed out she'd be like right make me a cup of tea take your mind off it uh, to a certain degree she didn't do anything that needed training or didn't do anything that needed um a certificate to say she could do it she treated me like a person and she recognized my issues to be real and to be legit I suppose anxiety I might have this wrong and everybody's throwing my stuff you have to go on the journey with them and I wouldn't have thought this at the time but having reflected back on it you have to go on the journey of anxiety with them and whatever point it starts at and whatever point you get to with it it will always sit in the background but you can't force a young person to want to do what they should be doing because anxiety is a much stronger force than being a mum is. I don't know what else I can say to that. It's anxiety beats the need, the motherly, the maternal instinct for what's best for your children. It just won temporarily. Won. Make sure your phone's on airplane mode because if it goes off, it oh, yeah. interferes with Jamie's equipment. Be more, I think it's more important for this bit to, for mum to explain. I understand why she did it, but from like a parent's perspective, I think that's important for her to okay. explain why you did that. Because you did it very slightly. I'm very impressed. Um, um, yeah, but you did hide it quite well. I did. So I was, at the time that you went into crisis, you were already under chums. Yeah. And you, and this goes back to you being not fitting this stereotypical mould of somebody who's anxious. You would go into meetings, you would go into your sessions with chums and you would eloquently explain what your anxiety was, how it presented, how it made you feel and what you should do, not or what you thought you should do, not to make it happen. So from that perspective, I was like, well, you know what you need to do. Come on, let's do it. Let's work together to do it. Yeah. So every session, every professional I ever went to I, I could not explain to them what we were living with at home. And I just felt no one's listening. In my heart, I would actually, if, if I could have poked you with a stick and made you have one of those moments, I would have done. Yeah. So in that hour session with them, you would present this way. And I hate that term, present. But at home, what we were living with was very different. Mm. Um, so I took it upon myself to record you having a panic attack in secret, you didn't know I was doing it. Uh, I very sly on my yeah. lap as um, I pressed record. Um, not because I wanted to forever capture what it was like, but because I felt I had to prove to people what was going on. Yeah. And although it wasn't a particularly bad panic attack. Mm. Not my worst. No, no, definitely not your worst, far from your worst. Yeah. Um, it was still significant enough when I showed the professionals. And not even the professionals, to be fair. Or, but do you know who I also showed it to? I don't think you know this. <gasps> I showed it to my boss. Did you? Yeah, and I'll tell you why. Because I was, I at the time, oh, of course. I was no, taking I so much time off. Yeah. And, and I was still trying to go into work normally and present myself normally. But I obviously looked exhausted and it was a real struggle mm. and although they were really really supportive it wasn't until I showed my boss the video that she was like 
Oh, <laughs> okay. And then, then she was right. Do whatever you need. You do whatever you need. You sort her out. Um, so that sort of was a turning point there for me. Okay, for sure. Yeah. yeah. I'll show you to Karen. That makes sense. And she was always really lovely and supportive, oh, yeah, but yeah. it wasn't until I showed her that she realised the significance. But that's what the professionals were like as well. Yeah. They were always lovely and supportive and knew there was an issue. But until I showed them the actual footage, then they were like, oh, okay, that's what we're dealing with. It's our same reaction every time, isn't it? That, okay. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Should we mm -hmm. watch it? I sound awful in it. You sound awful. <laughs> Excuse me? <laughs> It's just all the physical signs of panic, you know that. The physical signs of panic. Oh, what if it's, I don't feel, I don't think it is. It is, you know that, this is what you said last time. That's funny, Mum. My yeah. hair's so long. Mm -hmm. You know all the physical signs, Caitlin, and this is what it is. Yeah, you can. I cannot do this Come sit down. No, I can't Yeah. Come on, let's turn the... Turn the TV over. No, Mum, you need to listen to me when I say that I cannot do this anymore. Do you articulate yourself? <laughs> <laughs> you you down. No, I need you to listen to me when I talk. Did you finish that writing in that book? Yeah. And where did you put it? Yeah. Downstairs? Yeah. It's all right. Come here. I don't know what it is. <laughs> it's just panic, Caitlin. You know it's anxiety. Well, it's not. What, what do you possibly think it is? I feel sick. <laughs> Mum, I just... It's not going to... Caitlin, you know it's anxiety. Yeah, it I want to be out on my own skin. Yeah. I don't want to be inside. But okay. right. <laughs> Come and sit down. Oh. Come sit down. I can't sit down. Do you want me to walk with you? No. Mum, I don't want to sit down. You're working yourself up and up and up. You need to calm yourself down. I sit down for like two seconds. I'm like, no. Nope. <laughs> Come and sit down. I cannot sit down. Right, do you want me to walk with you? No, I don't know what I need to do. Have you had water today? Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to get some more water? No, I'm fine. Oh, Mum, I can't really. I honestly, please listen to me when I say this. I, I am listening. I cannot do this anymore. I really do not have the patience or the energy or the, or, or the mental capacity to be able to do this. Okay, I get that. Oh, Raise your vocabulary. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to school tomorrow. Um, it's not even about the exam. I just can't do it anymore. I can't be left alone. I get, I get really panicky okay. all the time. You're not on your own now, are you? <laughs> but I am. Now what you were doing you in school. You need to stop now. Yeah. <laughs> You're doing that. Oh, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. I get higher and higher. Mm -hmm. I want to get past this. Pass. It. Well, you will get past it. Yeah. You 100% will get past it. Definitely. I really hate this. I know you do. I really don't like it. My heart bounds. I know. Everything goes really horrible. <laughs> I don't think this is panic because my hands haven't gone sweaty. Mean, come on, you know the physical sign oh, of panic. But my hands haven't gone sweaty. Hey, Caitlin, you don't always do all of the symptoms, you know that. Oh. Mama, I really cannot anymore. I know. Mm. Is that bracelet on your wrist? Where is that one from? Don't try to I'm not. I've got it on my wrist. Yeah, two years later. That's really manky. <laughs> Still got it on. Haven't taken it off in like four years. The, the video itself is really difficult for me to watch and thinking about it now after having discussions with mum about the difficulty of what was going on um as a parent that must have been so difficult to turn around and be like I'm gonna have to film my child in this distressed state just so that someone will listen to us I can't imagine doing that and obviously I'm not a parent but to watch someone you love and care about go through something and then have to take a video of it and show it to someone who doesn't really know her for what she is I, I can't imagine thinking how she felt and probably the judgment that she perceived she was going to get from other people like what have you done to your child for her to be like this obviously she's never done anything none of my family have but it must have been I can't I, I love my mum to the moon and back I can't imagine to think how troubling that time period was for her and it makes me feel quite guilty looking back at it, back at it now i find it sad that it's something i had to do to for people to see how bad it was 
Um, and that wasn't even particularly bad. I keep saying it's like five. Um, oh, but I can also understand in Caitlin's situation and many others like her, why somebody would need to do that. Because people's perception of mental health isn't always the way it traditionally or stereotypically would present itself. Mm. So do I, in the recording, it certainly wasn't planned. Should it be that way? No, it shouldn't. I just don't think at the time there was enough of a focus or an appreciation of what we were going through as a family. Um, because there were days when she was still managing school and because she could articulate herself at, at particular times, yeah. because she could get in the car and go to whichever um, talking therapy you were going to that day, it was like, oh, it's not that bad. Well, actually, it is that bad. And for me to show you how bad it is, I need to capture that moment, which it shouldn't be like that. There should be some sort of... You've said afterwards that you would recommend for other people to do it. Uh, other people, yeah, people have spoken to me, not because they know... Yeah, but yeah, just yeah. because I think it's a more open topic now between parents. Definitely. Um, and people have said to me that they don't know how bad it is. They, what do I, I like to record it. Record it and show it to whoever you needed to show it to mm. and tell them this is what's going on. And that's what I, if anybody ever asks me, I always say record it. Yeah. Maybe that's the way we should be doing it. Maybe that's the answer to um, capturing the moment and the way somebody lives in their day-to-day -day life, maybe that's the... Well, I suppose it's an effective technique. It's definitely effective. Ooh. It's been effective for us. Yeah. When the idea of medication was mentioned, it was really difficult for me because throughout my life I'd been told, we're not going to go to medication, we're just going to deal with this through therapy and through talking to people. And for someone to turn around and say, you need medication or this is going to go really bad was it was a shock to the system but i i knew that to help my family and to help myself i had to do it i was still having people come to the house every day um Gemma and helen my support worker and mental health nurse would sit on that sofa and just talk to me take me out for coffee ask me what was going on it wouldn't always be focused on mental health or what was going on with me sometimes it'd just be about me as a person and me before all this happened um so that was I, in hindsight, CBT at that point would have just not made a difference. It would have probably made myself, uh, made me beat myself up more and be more negative about the whole situation. So I think the way that they dealt with it by that point with the medication and then the talking and then as time went on, introducing the therapies was a really good way to do it. Obviously it won't for everyone, but for me it worked perfectly. It was 100% the drugs in the intervention. I was powerless, genuinely powerless. I have quite a strong brain in terms of resilience but at that time I had I had no control over what was happening it's weird because your brain is one of the things that keeps you alive it helps with oxygenation and whatnot yet yeah, it seemed to it felt like at the time it was the thing that was trying to destroy me so it was even though we never said we put me on drugs or do this or do that it was drugs and the intervention and the people and cams and the family there was a truly and I <laughs> I don't want to take credit for something. I there was nothing that clicked and was like, Caitlin, you gotta sort your you gotta sort it out. There was just nothing like that. It was just over time. They were I only recently learned that one of them from work, the Arapiprasol is an antipsychotic for children. I didn't know that. And I know we swore we'd never put me on any sort of medication, but it was just a natural progression of getting used to the medication and getting used to the support and then things slowly developing into me being okay there was there was you know how people have those moments in films when they're like, oh, like i've got to do that i didn't have that i didn't have that what's it called an epiphany i've never had an epiphany about it ever i wasn't like this has got to really change look what you're doing to people it was just a natural progression of time I wish there was an epiphany that made me change my mind and was like, you got to sort this out, like grab it by the balls and slam it on the floor, Caitlin. But there was nothing of that variety. It was just a, a very slow process. Something I really wanted to do throughout this process was ask a practitioner or a professional why people like me get missed. So I've decided that I want to meet with my CAM psychiatrist 
and get her opinion and try and understand a little bit more as to why people like me get missed. Hiya. Hi, Caitlin. Nice to see Come you. Sit down. Hi. Thank you very Welcome. much. So I guess what I just want to ask you is a little bit more about your role within the trust and with within Bedfordshire Cams. My name's Harriet Stewart, mm -hmm. and I'm a consultant child and adolescent psychiatrist. And my job is really about looking at a child in the whole, child or a young person in the whole, mm -hmm. and thinking about the biological, psychological, and social reasons why they might be presenting to CAMS at a particular time in their lives. Okay. Would you say it's quite hard to gain the full picture with the maybe the little information that you have? Or is that something that comes over time to be able to look at a child, look at their symptoms and go, actually, I know what's going on? Yeah, it's a, that's a really good question. I think that's an excellent question, actually, because, yes, as you go on through your years of being a, a psychiatrist, mm. you do recognise patterns and you do pick things up. Mm -hmm. And often you pick them up reasonably quickly. And as you get more experience, that's quicker. Sometimes you can be wrong, of course. Obviously. That's a possibility. Mm -hmm. And also sometimes you can pick things up that the patient doesn't want to hear there are various things that they don't want to hear as well okay. and and it's up up to them what they choose to take on into their lives and practice i think okay. so i guess one thing i am really interested to know is in terms of the extensive training you get what you're taught i suppose in terms of um, what a typical anxious person is what you're told to look out for mm -hmm. uh, what um, the different kind of signs you can get mm -hmm. and then how you go from there in terms of diagnosing and um, mm. showing them the support they need. Mm. I think that the presentation of anxiety can be quite complex. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the typical symptoms are things like having your heart racing, yeah. bounding pulse, sweating, mm -hmm. uh, trembling, mm. all those kind of physiological symptoms, physical symptoms that you get when you're anxious, yeah. you also get a lot of avoidance. Mm -hmm. And the avoidance is the one that I think we miss. Mm -hmm. And I think we fail to pick up a lot of anxious people mm -hmm. because they don't always present with typical symptoms or because they don't perceive themselves as having those symptoms. Okay. So it's also a difficulty with perception mm -hmm. that you're on a train and you don't know why you suddenly want to get off. So it's people's understanding and, and perception of the symptoms can be different. Mm -hmm. And you don't necessarily ask somebody something if they're not aware that they've got it. Mm -hmm. So there's a difficulty. And I think lots of young women with yeah. anxiety get missed because they're quiet. Yes. And anxiety is a quiet thing and it's, it's sort of exemplified by avoidance. Mm -hmm. So avoidance is the key symptom. Mm -hmm. And so they you, might stay at home and not go to school, yeah. or they might not be able to go on a school trip, mm -hmm. or they might not be able to change classrooms with a whole load of books in a noisy environment. Yeah. And then they'll go off on their own and withdraw. And usually in schools, a, a quiet pupil is a good pupil, and those pupils don't get picked up. Yeah, of course. So they have to become quite noisy mm -hmm. to be picked up. So within, um, I guess some would describe my case as relatively mm. complex because I present quite well. I'm quite confident, yes. I'm outspoken, I'm very opinionated. Yes. Um, in a case like that, how would you go around dealing with someone who you know that there is something possibly wrong, but they are displaying as if there isn't? In terms of like a psychiatry approach to that, how would you navigate the pathways? I think you look at how much difficulty they're having. Okay. So are they having a lot of difficulty at school? Mm -hmm. Are there difficulties with peer relationships, with relationships with teachers? Can they stay in the classroom? Can they learn or are they being held back mm -hmm. by some of their symptoms? Mm -hmm. um, are they struggling at home, yeah. struggling to manage with getting to sleep? Struggle and sleep is a big symptom in psychiatry all yeah. to itself. Mm -hmm. Are they coping with eating? Are they managing their weight? Mm -hmm. All these kind of things, are they able to get out of the house? Mm -hmm. Do they enjoy life? Do they have low mood? So I'd be asking all those kind of questions mm -hmm. and I'm sure that you would be telling me yeah. back what you think. Mm -hmm. And then it's my job to listen to you mm -hmm. and to try and work out what's going wrong. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we don't get it right. Yeah. And sometimes we 
don't get the seriousness of it or the severity of it of and that's one of the things that that you were thinking about yeah how people hadn't seen how severe your symptoms yeah. were because you presented so well yeah and I think you know that that could be a problem yeah but the solution to that is keep trying if if, if, if you're really not not able to function mm -hmm. keep trying and keep keep looking and keep finding okay uh, so so would you say that's quite a hard part of your jo job judging it sounds terrible judging who and what and why should come into the service because obviously there's a lot of stick and um oh what's the word mm. begins with the c what's the word controversy yeah there's a lot of controversy in mm. terms of um oh they don't let people in they don't mm. understand what is your take on that and i assume that's probably one of the hardest part of your job I like think the resource managing the resource yeah but also recognising where problems are severe and where risk is. Yes. And risk is very much the role of the consultant psychiatrist in the team. Yeah. So recognising and identifying risk and high risk cases and admitting people to hospital, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes against their will yeah. as well, is a really difficult thing for families and young people, very painful and difficult. Mm -hmm. And I think that we try so hard to get it right. Mm and most of the time we get it right and sometimes very sadly we may not get it right mm -hmm. and uh, uh, risk assessment in itself is not particularly reliable you know even the written risk high level risk assessments are not very reliable mm -hmm. so it's sometimes about with children and young people being very cautious um, and you know thinking about what might happen yeah um, so in terms of me and my mm. family, um, when we were struggling to get a diagnosis mm -hmm. and struggling for people to listen to mm. us, my mum filmed one of my panic attacks. Mm. Um, I didn't know she was doing it, mm. um, but it was one of my um, lower level ones, but it was still pretty extreme. So mm. in terms of technology, not necessarily social media, but that saved us. Mm. It proved that I was genuinely going through what we were describing. Mm. Would you say that that's um, something that could be used or something that's beneficial? Or would you say that that's more I think it's really beneficial, okay. actually. Mm -hmm. I think I've often said to parents, look, when this happens, can you please just film it on your phone? Yeah. So, for example, if I'm seeing somebody with, I know, Tourette's syndrome, yeah. where I can't see the ticks because very often ticks wax and wane, so they sometimes present as being quite severe and sometimes they're not there at all. Yeah. So I say, when this happens, please you know make a little film of it on your phone yeah so I can see what's going on mm -hmm. because you can't always see what's going on in clinic no. in clinic you just get a snapshot yes. of the young person and that's not always enough and that's why we're trained in child psychiatry to talk to the teachers to talk to the parents to talk to the young person to ask about all these different aspects of a child's life maybe even to talk to social workers and so forth so that is very very important getting a holistic look of somebody yeah. not just the 30 minutes they're in your consulting room yeah for. definitely mm. i think that meeting with harriet was really really beneficial um in terms of the psychiatry side of things she gave a real insight to what it's like i think a lot of people assume that cams is sort of like unfair like they don't let very many people in and she's given um a clear review on why they don't and why they can't I think I did have a real sense of anger towards the system and towards the services because I did feel like I'd been ignored um, and I didn't understand. And then when they, when I met with them when I was in crisis, the care I got was immaculate, pretty much, apart from the odd issues here and there. Um, and I think I feel slightly I don't know, guilty because her job is quite hard. And I think that they get a lot of scrutiny when they don't deserve it. And I think that comes down to a lack of education and a lack of people understanding what she does on a daily basis. She does try her best. Everyone within the service and within the trust tries their best. But funding and staffing, it's just not all possible. It's like when you go to a shop and you want to return something and you're past the 21 day return policy and you get really, really angry at the cashier. It's not their fault. They don't make up the rules. They don't make up the return policy. It's, ex it's exactly the same. The people that are at the forefront of our care looking after us, they don't make the rules. They aren't in charge of the funding. They just essentially do as they're told and do it to the best of their ability. And I think people think it's their fault when it's not. It comes from a higher power. 
Does that make sense? This is my wall. It is, it's recently grown. I've got all of Nikki's stuff over there with the accreditation and all my certificates for training and stuff. And then everything else I've like ever done. I've got some mental health related like little quotey bits. This one's my favorite. <coughs> um, there's a guy like, I don't know, they've got flowers on their head and they're watering themselves. And they're saying that they're taking care of themselves and then they start sharing, which I really like. I started like keeping all of it and putting it all up when recovery started as it were. Um, so all of this stuff is like dated back from then, like 11th of July, 2018, that's last year. Um, it's all the stuff I've done since. I got better and originally we never thought I'd be able to do. So like those train tickets, even though they're only train tickets, they're quite immense because I would have never been able to get on the train in the state I was. And now I have and I've done all of it. Uh, they're, they're the place cards that they put on the front of your desk when you sit an exam and I kept all of them because the fact that I sat them and needed to be remembered that I actually did. I was looking at my Snapchat this morning and you get little memories pop up and um, there's a picture of my legs that I took before I went to the doctors to get given propanolol. So this day two years ago was when, the yeah. It's, it's weird, it's weird looking at it because stuff keeps popping up and I remember what happened on that day. Um, and in a way it's quite nice because now obviously I'm doing stuff like this to think that this time two years ago I was in a dark place. It's crazy. It seems like such a short period of time to feel better and be better. Um, the support from friends and family, the support from the services, being involved in the services even more. Um, almost what I went through being given a purpose. Um, I did it so I can do stuff like this, so I can raise awareness, so I can talk to people, so I can talk to professionals. It stamped it with validity and it, it's okay that you went through that because look at all the stuff you're doing now. Over the two years, the support has fizzled out now. Obviously, cams are still there. I know that they're there if I need them for the next few months. Um, but I've, as time went on, I was left to my own devices, um, which I think was quite helpful and very beneficial because now I can sort of do it by myself. This is where I go to school, sick form. Uh, I moved, I made the decision to move here because I, I wanted a change, um, I wanted a totally fresh start away from what it used to be. So I came here, um, I made some incredible friends, I love what I study um, and I seem to be relatively good at it um, and my grades show that but it's a really important place for me because it kind of gave me a new lease of life and it's made what I can do after this stage, very clear. I've always had the skills to be a nurse and to look after somebody, but I needed this experience to put into perspective that I can do it effectively. Um, and believe it or not, I've got all my university open days soon, which though talking about university is crazy because this time two years ago, there was, I struggled to leave the house and I'm thinking about moving away from home and like starting my life independently away from everything um so my plan is to go and do my mental health nursing degree and then go back into cams as a practitioner rather than a patient which is oh my god it's crazy um but i really hope to be able to do that um and to just make a difference to the to people like my practitioners made a difference to me It's now, what month are we in? November? So we filmed throughout the summer. I think throughout this whole process, one of the main things I've learned about myself is, and I've solidified in my head, is how resilient I am. I, I, looking at it now and reflecting upon it and having the discussions with the variety of people that I've spoken to, I am, I am really, really resilient. Some people wouldn't have been able, and some people aren't coping in the situation that I was in. Um, and I look at myself and I'm really proud of where I've come from and what I've been through and where it's led to now and the effect that I'm having on other people and the influence that I'm having within the service. Um, 
Caitlin two years ago sat inside her room not wanting to move, crying, can't, is, was unable to control herself. I would not imagine myself in this really empowering position. I, the idea of speaking in front of the 60 students I did in the assemblies this week would have made my knees tremble and I just would have hidden. So I'm immensely proud of myself for how far I've come. For the help and support that we've received from CAMS, from some really valuable friends that I've had that have been my support network, to how we pull together as a family, all of those sorts of things are what has allowed us to work through the whole journey with her. The thing that people have done to help me the most um, and to, to get me to this point is I've just been listened to. It sounds so simple, but I went through the first 15 years of life being brushed off and now recognise that I deserve to be listened to. Um, I was, my feelings were validated and I was treated like a person. There's, that is the biggest thing, that's the biggest thing anyone can do for anyone. Sit down, talk to them. You might not understand, but just be like, that probably is like really, really hard for you. Just make them feel that what they're going through isn't alien, isn't really abnormal. Um, that was when it all started to change, when people started to listen and people started to um, validate my feelings. That was when everything started to get better. And I don't think, and I might have this wrong, this journey will ever end. Kate will never not have anxiety. She will always have it. At some points in her life, it will be significantly higher. And in other points of her life, it may even take over again. And then the rest of the time, it will just rumble along in the background. So for us as a family, for me as a mum, it's about helping her manage living um, and the things that she wants to achieve in life whilst holding on to our anxiety and not letting it take over or when it does take over finding a way to pull it back again and live with anxiety. If I came across someone who was in the same position I was two years ago uh, I know how it feels to be told that it's going to be okay and that you'll get through it. I know it sounds like an empty promise and the idea of it just doesn't seem realistic but I'm speaking from experience I can promise that if you gather up all the energy that you have left, even if it's very little, and you listen to the people around you and you find the support, that there genuinely is a way to get out. You will not be left alone, you will not be left without support. You just gotta grab that energy inside and just give it all you've got. So we're going to take a five minute break now just to give you a chance to um, get a drink, uh, compose yourself if necessary um, and we'll be back with some Q&As. Can I please encourage you to type any questions that you have for Caitlin or Nikki in the chat facility, in the Q&A, sorry.
Hi everyone, welcome back. We're going to start the questions in uh, one more minute. So I'm just going to read out some of the comments that we've got. Um, that was an amazing film and it's brilliant to see how well you have done, Caitlin. Thank you, Rose. Um, Molly, not a question, but a comment. I'm so proud of you, Caitlin. This was probably one of the most accurate depictions of anxiety I've ever seen, and it was so well portrayed. You've really got your message across, and I hope you've touched so many people as much as you have me. Thanks, Molly. Yeah, there's some really lovely messages coming in the chat. So please keep them coming. Um, it's great hearing what you thought of the film. Uh, so I'm gonna start the Q&A with a question that was emailed in before the viewing. Um, so from a young person's perspective, Caitlin, how best can teachers, schools, colleges, other education facilities support a pupil who is experiencing mental health difficulties? Um, I think, like I said in the film, I think it's important to, it doesn't necessarily re require training in the way that some people expect it to. Um, in some cases, I was just genuinely treated like a person who was going through something quite severe. Um, no one really made out as if um, sort of like there was a protocol and a routine. It was just sort of, she's clearly struggling. Let's try and understand the symptoms she's going through and how anxiety can affect other areas. Like um, I was I, I, I didn't look great because of obviously what I was going through. I wasn't looking after myself very well. So to understand that maybe that might be a sign that um, someone's experiencing something they've never experienced before or that their anxiety is getting really bad. So I think it's important to pick up on like the little things. So like maybe the unkept hair and things like that, just to sort of, um, cause it's not always about what they're saying or they might not even be saying anything. So it's really important to pick up on the signs that, you know, might not necessarily come at you straight away. Do you, do you agree with me, Mum? I do, I do. And um, I suppose with um, one of the, certainly in secondary school, one of the things we struggled with the most with some teachers was, um, it just seemed to be a really taboo subject that they felt uncomfortable raising an issue. And that wasn't all teachers. I mean, mm. I had one teacher send you a lovely card. Do you remember as a little yeah. bit? pick you boost, up yeah that you really quite realize the impact that had but that was on your memory wall wasn't it in the end yeah um so it's just um not being not being worried or frightened or afraid from a teacher's perspective and being a teacher myself I get it um but to raise that question and raise that how are you doing today um and opening that conversation up rather than just there's yeah, some teachers that quite literally wouldn't wouldn't, wouldn't look at me <laughs> yeah um um, I'm not quite sure what or why, but yeah. they didn't, and that added to the anxieties. Mm. So just, I don't know how you train that in somebody if you can, but um, as a teacher, finding a way to be comfortable with opening up dialogue with young people. Mm. And if initially they can't, or they struggle to get that first bit out, give them the time and the space to be able to maybe figure out what they're gonna say or write it down, share a note, because uh, sometimes using different ways of communicating rather than just speaking face to face can make it a lot easier um, to try and figure out what you actually want to put into words. So don't initially assume after they tell you there's nothing wrong, that there's nothing wrong. Maybe give them the time to come forward and feel slightly more comfortable about speaking what, about what they're going through. Thank you. And um, obviously, you know, we're looking at a situation that happened two, three years ago. and 
there's so much work that's going on now in schools. There's so much training available, so much more support available. Um, and just to acknowledge that we that we hope that as at the outcome of that will be that teachers and staff will feel more confident in supporting young people. So I'm going to go to the next question from Val. Um, what message would you give a family that are going through a similar experience? Me? Yeah, you. Okay. Um, Nicola, it seems, yeah. <laughs> it seems really cliche, but you're not alone. Um, and I suppose the trick is finding the people that and the communities and the support groups and the professionals that help you realise and help you not to feel alone. Um, and, in terms of what you're going through and how you're coping with it. Um, oh, well, I don't know what else. I don't know. Um, I'm not sure. I don't know. Yeah, I I think you gave so many messages in the film, didn't you? You talked mm. about the importance of perseverance and not giving up and, you know, to keep knocking on those doors. Absolutely. It, it, I suppose when you come across one professional, whether that be in the education sector, whether that's someone you come across in health or potentially in social, if you don't get the response that helps, go knock on someone else's door. Yeah. Go and find somebody else who whose response does help. Um, and absolutely don't give up until you find the answer you're looking for. Yeah. Uh, and that the the answer you're looking for and the question as you go along quite often change and um, certainly what we experienced in crisis wasn't um, the same questions or the same response we needed um, in recovery um, so then it's again about finding those different areas within the services those different people those different support groups that that can offer the right level of support and what's needed at the time so yeah keep going until I mean in education find a missus right yeah Essentially, yeah, in terms of keeping Caitlin in school and helping her to sit her GCSE, she was instrumental in that. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I know, I definitely know that in the past few years, there's been since we recorded this that there's now CAMS workers, it, you notice it more, it's more embedded within schools, um, and that there's, you've got school counsellors, and it's, it's, it's essentially more advertised that the help you might need is available to you because, again, it was quite. I say this it was only two years ago it was quite taboo in terms of I don't really know where to go or there's limited support here in school and this is the place I come to to feel safe or um but I definitely know that in terms of support it's gone up in the past years with all the discussion especially on social media and everything around mental health so and in terms of if I can just go back to that first question in terms of what schools and colleges can do mm -hmm. essentially what Caitlin needed at the time she, she needed to still have contact with school because it meant it her, her hand was kept in the real world yeah to a certain degree I mean there was a good good few couple of months where we didn't move let alone and um, school definitely was an option yeah no. but in the run-up to and the recovery of she needed to be in school at some point to keep her hand on reality mm -hmm. otherwise she was completely shut in the door um, and in terms of being in school her safe place was the pastoral office with Miss Wright and in terms of, I suppose, what a school could provide in, in terms of, um, it's, it's that safe place. It's that acknowledging where that safe place can be for young people if it's all getting too much or they just need a bolt hole somewhere safe to be. Or that might be a person, it might be a place in the school. Um, but yeah, that was a great of great value at the time. Mm -hmm. And we've always quite often considered afterwards where would other people go if they didn't have a miss right? Yeah. Um, so I think that's quite an important thing for a school to consider and if I like hadn't have kept my foot in the door and hadn't been in constant contact with the school even when I wasn't at school and I was written off I would have probably struggled more than I did to go back because no one really knows what's going on no one's been updated on what's happened the past few months but having someone there that knew the situation then knew my new care plan the medicine I was on the therapy I was having made a massive difference in terms of feeling confident to go back into education and then to settle in and continue with my exams and stuff. Thank you. And acknowledging that support that you received in school, that amazing support, you know, I know that was something that was really important to you. And I know that that person is here today watching this film. So mm. she's 
she's typed a message about how incredibly proud she is of you um, and you know thank you to have for making that difference in your life yeah Ashling, have you got the next question yeah um so I'm glossing over a few that ask for any words of advice because the last 15 minutes Caitlin and Nicola will be sharing their words of advice mm -hmm. um, but I really wanted to share one from Jammu um, a question for Nicola what more can ELF do to support carers and parents uh, governors understand it's a 24-7 job that you do um so in terms of what else can do once you're within the service there is help uh, and from a parent's perspective um, there is help and don't get me wrong there's lots of charitable organizations that offer parental support uh, mind being one of them mm -hmm. and there's also support groups through um chums, chums those sorts of things yeah. um but i suppose it's <sighs> that phrase again raising awareness in parent with parents um in terms of support that's available and support groups that are available uh, websites leaflets literature yeah. um that people can act parents can access before it gets to the point it did with us mm -hmm. um I, I i just sometimes think there's a little bit missing at the beginning um and it's there it, it's and it is there and it is publicized in terms of help mm. but it's just not targeted enough at, at, at parents i don't think mm. um in terms of the the service thereafter um once you're once you're within the service and even if if you're not the, the support is still there but once you're inside it like you've got nikki's parent care group um but it's just kind of getting to that point where you can then meet people that are going through the same thing as you initially you, you can't really find anyone do you say yeah and i think it uh, it's that thing again isn't it and we often say oh it was a blessing uh, it, it was a curse and a blessing yeah um however i do think that if we hadn't had caitlin's crisis mental health crisis um and and the edge of psychosis and the need for valium and and everything else that went along with that yeah. we would be having a very different life now for caitlin she would be managing her anxiety not living her life um and anxiety always plods along in the background for her yeah. but if she hadn't had that crisis we wouldn't have had the help we've had and i think it's wrong that someone has to get to that point um and quite literally break before it's like schools when a school goes into special measures because officer puts in special measures the world and his wife gets thrown at it money services provision but shouldn't that happen initially is the idea rather than having to wait until someone's a early intervention is key yes and that's come on so far early intervention mm -hmm. has made huge strides since mm. our experiences definitely um without a shadow of a doubt early intervention when caitlin was poorly mm. even as a child actually yeah um we did fill in many ehcps uh not yeah, EHCPs, mm -hmm. you know, education healthcare plan, mm -hmm. e EHAs, early help assessments. Mm -hmm. We filled in many early help assessments, but she never quite met the criteria. She was never quite ill enough. Um, so yeah, I just feel it's a shame from um, in terms, but I also understand there's budgets and funding and it, that there, it's not a bottomless pit of money. Yeah. So yeah. Thank you for that. I know that um, Sarah is frantically replying to some of the questions in the Q&A box, um, so we're not ignoring them. Um, I'm going to go to um, a question we've got here from an anonymous attendee. Um, how do you think medication for you ongoing? Do you think you might be able to manage without medication over time? And the same person person is also asking what makes a good counsellor and why okay um i'll i'll, I'll go for the counsellor one first um I've, I've seen many a people um <laughs> over my time um and something that made a massive difference for me was when i was almost able to lead the sessions um in terms of i come in and it's like right what do you want to do what do you want to get out of this what do you want to discuss 
um and then what's our plan for like next week kind of thing not when you come in and it feels really clinical in terms of right this is what we're going to do this is how we're going to do it uh but when you're more uh, like at the end of the day it was like my experience my health how am I then gonna um look at my care plan and look at how I'm gonna try and feel better about this so it's definitely someone that allows you to be within the center of your care um rather than them leading it if that makes sense obviously I get there's an aspect of that but to kind of have like a joint decision on how you're going to do it is probably I'd say what makes a good counsellor yeah yeah and also looking at it um holistically in respect of there's so many aspects of a young person's life that um comes into the need for talking therapy in oh, terms yeah, of education social it's not just the emotional side of it um talking about future and goals and those sorts of things there's so much in, mm. involved rather than just in that moment yeah um and in terms of the medication <laughs> we were always naively anti-medication mm. until um uh really we needed it needed it probably needed it beforehand to be fair yeah. but we were always anti-medication until the need for valium basically essentially yeah um and yeah. the as a parent I was like no no that's not the best thing my child can't take medication that that's not the way to go however um alongside the crisis alongside the support and everything else um the medication is being and I, I'm I'm not saying that it's right for everybody mm. But it was instrumental in Caitlin's recovery because it took the edge off. Yeah, I was going to say that. It, I'm I'm still on it now. I still take it every day, um, and I think it it takes the first little bit off so that I can then use the CBT and all the therapy to then properly talk myself down. Um, and I had to spend a lot of time convincing myself that having a little bit of chemical help was like okay, because um, I know there was a, I got a little bit of stick for it like when I went back to school and stuff like that. And it was that side of it was really difficult to sort of be okay with um and do you reckon I could do it without in the future um yeah um I do think she can however um medication uh, for anything but mental medication for mental health there was one time where she took herself off it secretly well, secretly. well yeah yeah she thought she could cope without it um and it it didn't go quite so well because it goes planned no no so we're back on it so however what, you, what, whatever you do or whoever you're looking after whoever you're supporting if you even get like the slight hint that they might be trying to take themselves off of it or um I don't know sort of like self-help in that kind of way then always advise them to do it with a professional because yeah, if I'd have done it with way. more yeah if I'd have done it with more guidance it might have been a little bit better it wasn't for me at the time and probably won't be for a while but definitely seek some guidance from a professional um whoever's looking after you rather than just doing it yourself because that it, it doesn't go well at all um, that is such an important message yeah mm -hmm. it, it can really be quite dangerous especially yeah. with something that's you know um quite a strong medication um I wanted to just jump in and ask you one more question because I think a really key part of this whole film was um, the amazing uh, filmmaker that we worked with. Can you just explain a little bit about how Jamie made the process easy for both of you? So I think um, I'd, I'd never met Jamie before. I'd heard of Jamie and knew that um, he had previous clinical practice and stuff like that but I'd never actually come into contact with him and initially after the first meeting you could see his motivation and it wasn't just like from a, a work side of things it was from a personal side too he was genuinely interested in making sure that people were hearing experiences like mine and he wanted to facilitate that in the best way he could I mean the film looks fantastic I remember the first time someone watched it they were like this looks like it's been like professionally done and I was like it has and honestly even because he was sat behind the camera and I was talking about you know one of the hardest times of my life and he was just so understanding and so facilitating and if I needed a minute he'd give me a minute and it was he made it he made it so comfortable um yeah for me it was he you could tell he was genuinely interested and wasn't just like he had a genuine passion for it and wants people to hear others stories yeah I would say very similar 
yeah. um, like I said before, I would, it, it was never intended for me to be in it as much as, much as, as I you was. Were, no. um, so I wasn't expecting to meet Joni quite as much as I did. Mm. But he, yeah, you could see he wasn't um, just in it for the professional filming side of it. He had a genuine interest in mm. Caitlin and in um, and in promoting mental health and raising awareness. He made us both feel incredibly comfortable. Yeah. Um, and it's like having a conversation really rather than filming for something yeah um, and he let it, he I don't he asked the occasional question but he very much let Caitlin create her own yeah. script in the moment and just went with it he came in with ideas and like so did Nikki and so did Asling and everyone came in with the ideas but it was again it wasn't for his own professional gain as it were he was you lead it this is yours I want to help you make it therefore just tell me what you need me to do so it was, it was, the whole environment was very supportive and there was, yeah, no, he was fantastic. Yeah. And the other films he did were great too. So they're on the Trust YouTube channel, check them out. <laughs> Ashling, have you chosen one last question for us to ask? Yeah. Um, so this question actually came up in the chat, but I think it's one you'll both be quite keen to answer. Um, so the question is, what signs should people, I mean, I'm guessing parents specifically, be looking out for in very young children in relation to anxiety? Good question. I like that one. Yeah. Um, I think the way anxiety presents, although it has a typical, um, it doesn't have a, a one size fits all. So I think it's very much about you knowing your child. Um, and in terms of signs and symptoms for Caitlin, um, she was referred to Great Ormond Street when she was four because they were convinced she had digestive problems because of the what, what in retrospect was the physical symptoms um, of anxiety. Um, so I do think it's about knowing your child and knowing that something's not right um, and then um, finding the resources to yeah. get that support. So for Caitlin, it was she had a physical sign. Um, bent over double would go really pale shaky sweat talk quickly or <laughs> and in retrospect I've been a bit silly saying that because obviously it's anxiety yeah um um so they were her symptoms she would quite often bolt and run she would talk 10 to the dozen and it looked and sounded really strange <laughs> um but it was uh, her coping mechanism at the height of anxiety mm. um Everyone just thought she was really so, super talkative and confident. But actually, she was trying to fill a gap because if she didn't fill a gap, then she was going to panic. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I still do that now. You do. <laughs> you do. Um, so I think it's about, I wouldn't feel comfortable saying these are the signs and symptoms you need to be aware of when your child is four years old because it's not one size fits all. Yeah. Yeah. It's very much about knowing your child and knowing what doesn't feel right. I think, would you? Yeah, I know. I definitely agree with you. Even even now, my symptoms change and they alter. and. Um, they, they, they never stay the same. One day I might experience all the symptoms and the other day I don't really experience any of them. Um, so it's like about knowing the different pool but not necessarily assigning that to one child and then expecting that to be the only symptoms they ever have. Um, and I also think it's quite important to, I, I was labelled a lot in terms of, oh, she's naughty, oh, she just wants attention. Obviously there can be preconceived ideas and naturally as humans we do conceive ideas about what we think is going on but I, I passionately don't want people to allow that to stick because if you assume and then that's the way you're going to think that it's going to be a lot more difficult to get help and sort of move to the next stage if you get your heart set on one idea or this must be their problem because no one originally said to mum or my dad that it could be anxiety or everyone just thought I was so don't don't apply labels basically they might be that young but there is the possibility that they're suffering from um, a mental health problem and I don't think that those labels should be applied and then stuck unless you know you've got solid evidence to keep them there like a diagnosis for instance because I didn't get mine until I was 15 did I well anxiety was first mentioned when you were about eight or nine but yeah um and you were diagnosed with anxiety but not diagnosed with anxiety and panic disorder until you were 15 yeah so never I, d I just think it's really important to not especially with young children because the symptoms will change and they'll fluctuate. So don't necessarily apply a label, um, sort of seek that advice and then go from there, really. Um, I think those labels need to be explored. Oh, uh, definitely. They need to, but I think the idea of putting it, putting one on and then not looking for anything else can be detrimental in some cases. 
yeah. but to also understand that symptoms change and they it's it's never the same especially for someone with anxiety the next the two different days they're not the same they're never the same and i think we've done really well in terms of promoting mental health and and, and breaking the taboo and having those open conversations and recognizing what anxiety may look like in our young adults teenagers secondary school i don't think we're we're necessarily as far on in primary provision as we are secondary i mean i when i spoke at one of the conferences i had a primary school teacher come up to me afterwards um and then i did an assembly at their school and i don't think they'd ever really been open to the idea and that was why the teacher was so motivated to want to have me there because that conversation isn't really opened up with younger children um and that i there's, that there's sort of no excuse as to why it can't be just maybe change the language you use um, and sort of look more in depth to what they're saying and what they're trying to get across to you um, and when she did that assembly in the, that primary school mm-hmm. I think there were seven and eight year olds weren't yeah, they? They were, they were uh, there was lots of questions in the room and there were some questions were really sweet weren't they? yeah um, and there were some questions along the lines of is this normal that I do this yeah and, I called them I called them big feelings to try and um, like sort of facilitate the group I was with but um, that that yeah, there was a lot of questions as to again validation. They might be that young, but they they still need to be told that what they're feeling is normal. They've never experienced it before, mm-hmm. so those signs and symptoms need to be validated, which I think is really important. Which I I had a lack of, and that was I think I struggled. But obviously now is it's a lot stranger. Like I spoke at a school, you wouldn't have had that when I was younger. Um, so it's it's definitely changing. Yeah. And it's the importance, isn't it, of teaching people that emotional language and yeah. how to express themselves. But actually, the, the key message is about being open and honest. Yeah. And, I mean, it's and, like if someone came to you and said that like they'd broken their arm or they thought they'd broken their arm, you'd ask them where it hurt. You ask them what they can do. There's there's no reason that you can't do that with someone's emotional well-being either. It's just you need to slightly alter the questions and the way you answer them. That's 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 it, really yeah and I understand that that can be hard for some people to do it's not it's not a given but we we can definitely get there yeah so I just wanted to finally mention before we ask you to sort of um give us your final thoughts Caitlin and Nicola um you mentioned that you will now study in mental health nursing um and what do you think you are going to be able to bring to that as a person with lived experience um I mean I think I can definitely um I don't know I, th- I think about this quite often because like I say in the film the even then I was just looking at universities I hadn't had my place finalized or anything like that but I think there's just a different level of understanding when you've experienced something similar to someone in terms of how you deal with them and how you can address them and sort of the advice you can give and obviously validating someone's feelings is important and I feel having my own experiences I can do that and sort of like mean it and not that other people who haven't don't but mean it in a way that I can then like I don't want anyone to ever have to feel the way I feel and I know that's impossible but if I can then maybe take the edge off of how someone's feeling then I know that I've I've successfully done what I came to do and I think that'll really give me and the people I've worked with and the the pathways that have now opened as a result of this and I, I, I know I didn't like what I went through but I wouldn't change it for the world it's I didn't know I wanted to be a nurse until this happened so I'm, I'm, I'm thankful for it in a weird way to be honest I might change it a bit okay be <laughs> on, yeah I mean some areas of it weren't fantastic yeah. but it, it, it did change my life in positive ways too yeah. oh yeah. we've got a well, nice question in book in the chat about writing a book you I would mean, write I, an amazing book I, I would i struggle to write my assignments but like <laughs> i can try that'd be amazing yeah if anyone wanted to hear it i would but i don't i don't i don't know if i would go that far <laughs> my boyfriend's convinced that netflix are going to contact me <laughs> well who knows after this premiere I mean, yeah <laughs> <laughs> so I'd like to invite Sarah. Is there anything that you'd like to say before we close? Just I'm I'm in awe, really. I think that's been a it's been an incredible afternoon. Um and just so grateful to hear from both of you about about what you've been through and how strong you are and how generous you are with your time and your thoughts and your kind of constructive 
feedback about how we can try and make services better. So just really thank you so, so much. It's been amazing. Thank you. Thank you. I know, Caitlin, you've got a few words that you'd like to say. Um, I mean, I, I say this a lot and I will continue to say this, but supporting someone in the situation I was in um, and having the feelings that I was having, it doesn't necessarily take specialist training, as it were, um, just to validate their feelings and to treat them like a person and not allow them to feel alienated. Because what they're going through is, is it's becoming more and more normal in a way it shouldn't be, but it should also it's good in the way that it's being accepted so I just kind of think that don't don't close them out don't make them feel different um obviously still accept what they're going through but you know don't don't push them out because if you do that they're less likely to come forward I think just opening up again those lines of communication is it's really really important really important yeah Nicola any parting words of advice um, I just want to, I suppose, from a parent's perspective, um, I suppose it's easy for me to say in retrospect, um, but you are your child's best advocate. If you know something isn't right, if you know that um, your child is struggling, but you can't quite put your finger on what, how, why or when, um, you keep knocking on those doors until you get the right help. And if one door closes, um, or you don't get the response that helps you and your family, go and knock on another door. You've got your education services, if your child is in school, college or university, that they, they, the services are much, much improved from our time oh, yeah. when, when we needed it. Um, make the most of those services. Don't be ashamed to ask for help. No. And don't be ashamed to tell people what's going on, because if you don't tell people what's going on, um, then you can't be targeted with the right help and right support and right mm. services. And if you are struggling to articulate to the extreme you need to, to explain what your child is going through, record an episode. Yep. Because that made a huge it did make difference, a difference for us. us. I'm also aware of how lucky I am to have my mum. <laughs> I would just like to say that. But she she did go above and beyond and yeah clap above and beyond <laughs> she did I, I know she's my mum but like it's just I wouldn't I wouldn't be where I am without her and I know it was everyone else but she got me the help and she was like no she needs this this is what we're going to do so I wouldn't have I was winging that part I didn't really know what it was that you needed I was just kept asking until we, yeah. we got what we needed and once we got to crisis I didn't really need to ask then because everybody just all of a sudden everyone swarmed and the help was yeah. there so from a parent's perspective you know your child and you are their best advocate so keep speaking for them use the services that are available to you and I'm I just I, I'd just like to plug the amazing parent carer forums that are out there as well that's a, that you know really provide a, a much needed network of support um and thank you very much I know some of the representatives are here today so I would just like to say a huge thank you to everyone for coming along today um, and for taking the time um, on your Friday evening to, um, to watch our film. Um, we will be able to, um, this will be available on our Trust YouTube channel um, and you can watch it on demand apparently um and you can um then watch it whenever you're comfortable or, or whenever it's convenient for you to watch or you can watch it um straight away on the youtube channel and what we'll be doing is we'll be sending the link out to that to all of you the whole event will be recorded we'd really encourage you please we've got educators in the room we've got commissioners in the room we would really encourage you Please to use this as a resource to raise awareness within your establishments, within your networks and um, to help other young people. I know that the one thing that Caitlin said that the reason she wanted to put herself through this process was that she wanted to be able to help even just one other young person. Yes. So. Thank you very much to everyone. Thank you to Ashling for being an amazing um support through this and I'm so glad that we finally managed to get this fantastic film out there. Uh, just before we finish, um, the 
um, pupil participation at um, CAMS. Nikki, you're a saint. You actually are. We wouldn't have been able to do this without you. Um, you made the whole process easier. And I think too, I know we only met like halfway through, but even then, just like sharing the experience with you guys, like me and Nikki went to the beach together. It was, it was, it was, it was it was really fun and we wouldn't have been able to do it without you so thank you for giving me this platform to be able to try and help other people absolutely service user group is a huge part of recovery yeah it massive. is part of the whole process it's not as something that comes at the end mm -hmm. um it's need like, more funding yeah it does funding to hit people yeah it's such <laughs> an important <laughs> it's such an important part of the service um i think it it's not considered how important it is or it's not considered enough in terms of how important it is it's had a huge impact on Caitlin's recovery yeah it's and been it, Caitlin's recovery yeah it has I know that Nikki's not and I think aren't classified as clinicians but a, me a major part of it was meeting other people and allowing them to like facilitate the the talks and like parents have to meet people that are going through similar things but they were my people that were going through similar things um and Nikki and I think they it's it's just brilliant yeah thank you Nikki yes and I think and thank you, Jamie. Yeah, and Jamie. Jamie smashed it. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, thank you. That's that's lovely to hear. Um, and it was amazing to be able to, it's amazing to be able to work with all of the amazing young people that we do. Um, it's a real privilege. We love our jobs. So thank you. Um, I also just wanted to say we will include some support for parents and carers and for young people along with the probably in the description of the YouTube for this video, um, along with instructions on how to self-refer to CAMS, how to refer a young person to CAMS. So if you do need that, um, please don't forget to check that out as well. And we'll probably include a link to all of the previous work that we've done with the amazing yeah. So nice. there's, a lot, there's a lot more to check out than just this recording. Definitely is. So please do. Thank you, everyone. Have a lovely weekend and thank you for joining us. Thanks for coming, everyone. <laughs> thank you.